Welcome back to Truck Tech, everyone. You know, this week we're up, we're actually bringing a little episode that we did in uh, Detroit a few weeks back when we caught up with the folks at RRAI, which is stands for Robotic Research. But you can forget that name because as of this week, they've changed their name to Forterra. Now, don't get confused with Proterra. That's another company. Forterra is basically all about automation for harsh environments, starting with the military, which is where these guys got their start back in 2002. And more recently, uh, working in forestry or off off highway work for uh, lumber, and um, finally out at distribution yards where trailers are brought in by trucks from uh, railheads and then uh, you know moved into position. And we're going to spend most of our time looking at that today and talking with Josh Arrojo, who is the uh, CEO of of Forterra, about the business and how they came to be and what they're doing now in Detroit. So I hope you enjoy it. Well, truck check sometimes gets cold, and it is cold here in Detroit, but we are happy to be out here in the southwest Detroit area with Josh Arroyo, who is the CEO of Forterra, which is formerly known as RRAI, or Robotic Research. These guys are bringing autonomy to a place where it can really be useful, and that is in the distribution yard. Josh, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming yeah, over from Baltimore to do this. We just want to get a good sense of what it is that you're doing here in this yard. Yeah, no, great question. So we are enabling our partner TSIS to do transportation moves inside of a confined logistics yard. We think this is a perfect application for us to showcase our ability to move in these highly uh, highly austere environments. When you look around, we have sn snow, uh, potholes, mud, and do very precision, very advanced economy to enable that customer's operation to run more efficiently and more safely. You come out of a background that is all about this, the military background. You still have a lot of military work that, that you're doing. Um, and those, again, austere environments, tough environments. You have worked out the precision, that precision side of, of moving trailers into place within, what, six inches of each other. Right. Obviously, this is something you learned elsewhere. That's right. Uh, you know, we have a, a pretty long history. We started back in 2002, well before the DARPA Grand Challenge, really trying to solve uh, some of the hardest problems in autonomy, some of these uh, uh, problems like unstructured environments, uh, vegetation, uh, we're talking uh, how do you deal with potholes and, and uh, support services that aren't fully, uh, you know, aren't fully solid. We basically looked at areas in autonomy that we can leverage that technology to enable customer operations. And one of the great, great examples of this is, is logistics yards and in particular, uh, intermodal sites. So we think this is a great uh, transfer of that technology developed in the military deployed overseas, really bringing it inside of, a, inside of an industrial logistics application. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about where we are now. We've got a CSX rail yard, how far down the road, two miles? It's about two miles down the road. Yeah, right. and what's happening day to day here? I mean, you've got, obviously, the CalMAR behind us has been equipped for autonomous operation. You have two of those in operation here. Let's talk about what you're actually doing right here. That's right. So, uh, so the drivers will drive, uh, pick up trailers from the logistics site, from the uh, from the railhead, bring it over the highway that two that two miles onto the site here. Uh, from there, they'll drop the trailer and continue on back onto the road, back to the uh, back to the intermodal yard. From that point, we take those trailers and park them in a very organized and tight manner. So we're basically taking that driver, uh, uh, doing what they do best, which is driving, uh, you know, doing the repeatable routes on the highway. We're optimizing the inside of the yard by doing these very tight uh, parking maneuvers, which usually takes a lot of time. It's usually where you see most of the accidents and, and incidents. And we're doing these in, in very highly precise uh, maneuvers inside the yard. Okay, so I had an opportunity to go through that and actually uh, ride this morning and and see that one of those parked. And then I said, let's see a park one next to it without me in it. And in fact, it was only a handful of moves, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of sharp moves with that wheel, but with about six inches between trailers That's right. where they're done. That's pretty slick. Right, and what it enables them to do here on this specific site is really optimize the space that they use. So instead of a where you can typically park uh, 200 trailers if they're driven by a human, we can compress that down to about 400 trailers inside of the same space, which when you're talking about uh, you know real estate, uh, uh, real estate footprint and the ability to optimize those operations, uh, it's a place where we found uh, autonomy is really value added. Yeah, and there is uh, obviously with the CalMARS, you have the opportunity to keep training them. I noticed, for example, you have a LiDAR at the back end. Obviously, no driver is able to see kind of under right. that under that uh, uh, tr uh, yard 
trailer, tractor, I should say, um, but you're helping them do that, right? Well, and we take the approach of really integrating with partners like TSIS, where we can come on site, integrate into their operations, look for ways to both improve their operation and continue to advance our autonomy. So that close partnership with companies like TSIS is critical to, to making sure autonomy solves the problem and solves it holistically when inside of their operation. Right. Ultimately, you want to be able to have tra uh, trucks like we see right over here uh, come in, drop their trailer in a certain place, then have the CalMAR, the autonomous vehicle, come pick it up and put it where it should be rather than them having to worry about precision parking. That's right. right. It's keeping the drivers on the road and keeping the robots in the yard and really performing those autonomous maneuvers where uh, you can re re deploy autonomy responsibly, safely, and really maximize the, uh, the the capabilities of an autonomous system. Now, it's a big kafunk when we get that fifth wheel or that, that, uh, that uh, kingpin in place, but I notice that we're still uh, manually doing, you know, the glad handing with the, with the air brakes and that sort of thing. Um, more opportunity for autonomy with this? That's right. And there's a few different approaches to dealing with the glad hands issue. And what this is, is how do you connect the air brakes from the vehicle to the trailer? Uh, there's things that you can do with robotic arms. We have a, a robotic arm solution. Uh, you can do things on the trailer side, on, on smart trailers. And I think that as the industry evolves, we'll see better, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a better sense of, of what the ultimate solution is. But a lot of that's customer driven uh, mm -hmm. on what they want to do and what type of investment they want to make to uh, to enable that trailer side operation. Right. Uh, have you now with the two that you've had so far, have you been able to increase throughput with this already in terms of what you're doing? I mean, this is still kind of a pilot, isn't it? Or is it's it a pilot, but we've been able to increase throughput, uh, really demonstrated with that customer that uh, we're adding value to their site. Uh, I don't think they have the uh, the appetite to do ongoing experimentation if it's going to interrupt a day-to-day -day operation. So from what we've seen is uh, we're able to both uh, reduce the footprint that they're using to, to park trailers, increase their capacity, uh, as well as improve the efficiency of the parking operation. Terra name, and, and I don't have to tell you that it does sound like one that, you know, was out there before uh, in, in Proterra, nothing related to that. But but I guess I want to understand something about the strategy of Forterra and where you want to go with it. Sure. Yeah. Our approach, you know, given our, our history and defense really, really started there. And that's a place where we want to get our product out in the field first. Um, so we're looking at these, uh, these defense programs that are really near term needs to de develop autonomy in hundreds, uh, hundreds of vehicle, even thousands of vehicle scale over the next couple of years. So our focus is really to deliver those systems and capabilities to those customers while simultaneously finding commercial applications like we're seeing out here at TSIS, where we can really add value in, in, the, in a similar type of environment, unstructured, rugged, austere, um, high precision, high reliability, and really validate those use cases and that product market fit with those customers. And then simultaneously partner with the leading OEMs in those markets to really get integrated into the production line, uh, provide that uh, fully safety certified, robust product uh, that can then roll out to the commercial uh, commercial markets uh, in the coming years. Uh, as we look at further on, you know, expanding opportunities, um, you know, these industrial applications, partner with that OEM, uh, really validating those use cases and product market fit with our partners on the um, on the operation side. It, that, that's really where we're going. Well, and with our AI, which had a, a had a dot in there for AI, I think, not exactly one that rolls off the tongue anyway. So going to a name like this does sort of um, not commonize, but makes you a little bit more approachable, doesn't it? I, th I think that's right. I think uh, I think it's a uh, it's a you know an acronym uh, name is you know there's plenty of those out there. We really wanted something to encapsulate where we're going. Uh, where we're going is you know on the ground with our customers, uh, delivering, uh, you know, autonomy into the most difficult and robust environments. Uh, and really over the last three years, we've been focusing on taking that 20 year history of experience and technology and productizing it in certain applications, defense applications, uh, and industrial logistics. So that, that transition on the name really just uh, reflects that transition of us from a, uh, applied research company into delivering a product, a robust product to our customers. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, the, you know, the starting point I, I remember you know, my history, I was with General Motors. We worked with what used to be called Tardec and things like that. And, you know, a leader follower and things like that. That was all your work, wasn't it? That's right. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of, uh, we're the uh, the autonomy company most people haven't heard of. Uh, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes and and really uh, enabling our customers to, to be successful. In the case of, of the military, yeah, the leader follower program is one we've been on for a number of years. 
Uh, we really think it's a vital technology for, for the warfighter and soldiers and Marines to take them out of harm's way. Uh, but it has a lot of similar applications to industrial and commercial uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been working on a project with Mac Defense, Mac Trucks. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what you've done with them? That's right. So there's a program called Common Tactical Truck. It's essentially a Class A truck uh, uh, that the military is uh, acquiring. And uh, we work with Mac on on automating. We have uh, Mac Ran, it's automated. Uh, really, again, focused on these uh, ruggedized environments, uh, as well as uh, some work up in Canada with FP, FP Innovations. And again, this is looking at uh, working to deploy, deploy autonomy responsibly, safely, in ruggedized environments where you are uh, removing people from the, the dull, dirty, dangerous type of environments. So we can get a look here on some B-roll that y'all provided at your forestry. So we're kind of looking at that right now. But but the thought here is that in the forestry environments, is, is a lot like what we're seeing outside uh, in the yard here where you're removing certain specific routes or what, how does that work? Yeah, I think that at the core of it is these uh, these very austere, rugged environments where you're running on dirt roads, you're running in inclement weather, uh, uh, ruggedized environments that you know are difficult for a human to drive, let alone uh, uh, autonomy. And it's a way for us to deploy what we think is a, a real capability of uh, of operating those environments. So uh, again, it's it's moving uh, resource. You know, think of logging roads, logging runs, uh, moving it from. Uh, the harvest site to the uh, to the mill, um, and and doing it in a repeatable, safe, consistent manner. One of the first applications for autonomy really was in the mining space, I think. And and you know, I'm thinking of uh, Rio Tinto, some of those things that that happened, and we've seen some stuff. I think in it might be Norway that Volvo has done mm -hmm. with autonomous mining trucks. Is that an area that you're looking at? I mean, that would seem to fit this sort of yeah uh, it is and, and we have uh we have some work that we're planning to do around and we'll get into the specifics but uh around mining applications but again uh we think these industrial use cases where you have this high utilization uh with customers that are really demanding autonomy um uh, is going to be our first uh first point of entry right you know one of the things that goes with autonomy or seems to go with it is electrification i mean you know we we obviously talk on this show a lot about electrification as well as autonomy as well as you know some of the things called alternative fuels like you know uh Hydrogen, uh, internal combustion engines are becoming popular. The idea of them is anyway. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, is this something where, uh, you know, there is kind of a, a line of sight towards going electric with these things? Or is this something where right now, because diesel doesn't cost what electrification costs, is it? Yeah, I think we take an agnostic approach to the base vehicle platform. So depending on on what our customers' desires and demands are, uh, they may want us to automate an electric version of the vehicle. Uh, we really take an agnostic approach, although we do find that uh, with that electrification, there's typically a complete redesign of the, of the vehicle architecture, which tends to lend itself to, to being better to automate from a driver wire system standpoint, from electric electrical system standpoint. Uh, but if that customer says, hey, we'd like to stick with the diesel vehicle, we're, we're happy to do it. Um, but I think we're about a mix right now. I've had to think through uh, both military and commercial vehicles that have electric or diesel, um, you know. For us, it's uh, it's what is that ultimate uh, application and what does the customer need? You're basically an outfitter of autonomous systems. Is that correct? Is that the right way to think of it? I think we take two approaches. We'll, we'll upfit autonomous systems in early stages of pilots like we're seeing out here. Those two Calamars, we completely uh, retrofitted from the ground up with our uh, own, you know, internally developed driver wire system, uh, the auto drive autonomy kit. Uh, but in some cases, we'll integrate directly in the manufacturing line. So on our defense programs, we're on a production program that is integrating our autonomy as the vehicle is being built on the production line. We'll commission our software on the back end and then deliver that to the customer. So we take a, you know, we take both approaches, but our ultimate end state is to partner with those OEMs uh, to deliver the autonomy. Line side. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. And it's interesting because those, and we're going to get over to sort of the on highway piece of this in a moment. But those are the two approaches, right? I mean, if you look at uh, Kodiak Robotics, and of course, Kodiak is familiar to you for another reason that we'll get into, but uh, Kodiak is taking the upfit approach, at least for now. Aurora Innovation, another leader in the space, is you know working with Continental to do the uh, line side delivery of hardened, uh, you know, automotive grade software. So you have the two approaches, right? You're taking both of them, what you say. Um, uh, let's talk for just a moment about some of the programs that you're on, you're on pretty much everything the military has right now. Is that right? As far as we know, uh, so really anything that's going into production. So uh, the military has been experimenting for a long time. I mean, going back to the early 2000s, late 90s on autonomy. Uh, we're, they've now transitioned into production on uh, on at least one program, and there's several more in the pipeline. So we're on 
run all those programs and, and really close partner with DOD, just given our experience and understanding of the market, the capability of our technology. Uh, and really, it's just the core focus of what drives us as a company is to deliver that uh, that capability to the warfighter. Sure. You started there, you're coming out now into some of these other commercial applications. The reason I brought up Kodiak is because they started out in the autonomous uh, over the road trucking space. That's their main focus. But they've also been on a program, uh, say one of the programs that you're on, uh, you know, for, for DOD, they took a Ford F-150. They've shown a prototype of that. Uh, this idea of going back and forth. And I think there's some interest in the part of the military to take advantage of commercial technology, right? That's right. I and mean, we think, uh, you know, my experience in the military, was, I was in the Marines for, for a number of years. And when I had a military designed, military grade uh, system, uh, it typically wasn't as performant as something you get commercially. Uh, and, and I'm guessing from the military's perspective, it's a lot more expensive, a lot less reliable. Uh, and so the desire of the military or the, or the Department of Defense to bring in commercial technologies, uh, we think it's a great approach. Uh, and we think that there's a, a marketing ecosystem of, of uh, commercial autonomy providers uh, that can actually fulfill that demand, us being one of them. So we're, we're pretty excited about the shift uh, within the DOD from less experimentation and let's get these things fielded and in the, into the hands of soldiers and Marines. Right, right. The, um, the idea of some of the things that I think, you know, another competitor uh, of yours, which would be Outrider, is already, you know, doing kind of the, the glad hands and, you know, autonomous, uh, they have the arm and they've got, you know, the autonomous uh, um, hookup of the of the, of braking and that, and that sort of thing. Are these things that are also on your sort of plan as you go forward or will it be specific to customer desire? I think it's, we take more a, a very close partnership approach with customers, both OEMs and with those end customers. And we really look at their operation uh, and how they operate both today and how they would operate with autonomy. So we think it's a, uh, a very uh, situation dependent what that solution is going to be on on the glad hand side, for instance. But uh, really, we take a long term customer focused approach to determine what autonomy is going to bring to their operation. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about, and again, I know you're not going there in, in terms of the over the road autonomy. Are we looking at sort of some false hopes here or do we, do you see a, a longer rollout? Obviously we're, we're talking a couple, uh, again, Aurora and Kodiak say they'll do at least some commercial operations in 24. Um, Torque Robotics, another strong competitor because they're tie in with Daimler Truck. Uh, you know, has a, a little longer time frame, but we know they have their redundant chassis, for example. Um, do you see this rolling out in a meaningful way over the next few years or not? We, you know, I'd, I'd say, look, we're not in that market, uh, but we do, uh, we are big supporters of what they're doing. Uh, and we, we wish them the best and we hope they're successful in hitting the timelines they've set out. Um, although I don't have a, any insights into how they do that internally, we're, we're hoping they do we're hoping they do great. Yeah, yeah, but but you wouldn't you you you're not of the mind that it's going to take longer, a lot longer, for example, to to get there. I mean, you're obviously watching the progress because it's very relevant to what you're doing. That's right. I, I mean, I think there has been setbacks. I mean, there's things around base vehicle availability with that redundant system. Uh, there's things like regulation. Uh, what is safe enough? Um, uh, how do they how do they do their uh, validate their safety cases? So uh, you know, it's an interesting. Uh, you know, they're doing a lot of inter interesting work. We're definitely paying close attention to what they're doing. Uh, but again, we're focused in a entirely different part of the market. And the good news is when it comes to regulations, you don't really have to wait around for that. I mean, because most of this is private yard and, and like you said, it's your environments, things like that. You're not really uh, governed by that much, are you? We tend to try to, uh, we don't want to be blocked by regulations that haven't been fully vetted or, or sorted out. And we look at the places where you can deploy autonomy safely, responsibly, uh, without the regulatory uncertainty, those are there as we tend to focus. We think it's a much more uh, near-term addressable market with a with a really big problem our customers have that we we feel we have a solution that solves it. Mm -hmm. Let's switch to, just for a moment to finances. You raised uh, $228 million, I think is the number, uh, in the Series A a couple of years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, talk about sort of what you see now that you're the CEO. For the business going forward, do you see this as a public business? Do you see this as a business that, you know, again, you know, we're past the SPAC bubble and we see new uh, regulations coming that are making SPACs a whole lot like IPOs now. So, uh, you know, that's probably not even in the consideration set anymore. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, your runway, I presume, is pretty good because you're generating revenue from these programs. That's right. I, th I think from our perspective, we're just focused on scaling and, and getting into cash flow positive. So being able to deploy 
autonomy as a business, uh, something that's uh, you know not been done at scale to date. And so that's really where our focus is, is really getting, uh, getting these systems fielded, deployed, uh, generating revenue and value for our customers. And you know we'll evaluate what that long-term uh, financing, whether it's public or, or what uh, down the road, but you know we have a uh, pretty exciting road ahead from us, both on defense and in these industrial applications to really deliver uh, a, a, you know, what we think is a market leading robust product to those customers. Did you, uh, can you talk a little bit about employment and how that's grown? I presume it's grown over the last few years. Uh, that's right. So we're about 200 and about 250 employees today. Uh, I think when I joined in early 2021, we're about 110. So we've had a pretty significant growth, uh, both on an employees and in terms of programs and customers we're working with. Um, Again, that shift and that, that growth is really focused on productizing. Uh, it's something that you know you have done in, in autonomy and really being able to deliver at scale uh, autonomous systems to end users uh, uh, that that meets the capabilities and and uh, and uh, capabilities that they that they need. Sure, sure. Josh, thanks so much. This has been great. I, I appreciate you coming again to Detroit to do this. Um, most of your research and the work that. You're sort of best known for us back over in Maryland, is that correct? That's right. We're headquartered just outside of Washington, D.C. in Clarksburg, Maryland. Uh, we have a uh, test facility, which we'd love to have you up there at some point in Idaho, where we test uh, our robots in some of the most robust environments. Uh, then we have an office down in San Antonio. So, uh, but yeah, the core of what we do is out in Maryland. And uh, yeah, we'd love to have you up there at some point. Well, thanks again for being here. With it. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks. So now we have a much better understanding of what's going on in this space, at least from the Forterra perspective. You know, they've got lots and lots of competition, uh, and it seems to be growing all the time. Over in Europe, there's a company called Furride that is working on this. There's another company uh, that announced uh, down in uh, in the south uh, last week that they will be doing autonomous yard work. Uh, they're called uh, IC, high S-E-E. And finally, the one that we've probably written most about over the months is Outrider, and they are probably farthest along in terms of having all of the aspects of yard automation uh, in place. But uh, for, for this time, we had a chance to actually get out there and cold morning in Detroit. Thank you for watching.